prayer, we've just been praying, God, capture us with grace. Every single person listening, watching, present has sinned. We've probably all sinned in the last few minutes. And every single one of us needs your grace. Lord, for some of us, maybe we've messed up terribly or royal this week. And we just need to be reminded that you love us as we are. That you died for us in spite of our sin and in fact because of our sin. So God, I pray that what we've sung would be true for each of us. Capture us with your Before I uh, jump into the message, I want to remind everybody that that includes anyone who's listening online or even happens to be present here in this room, we want to pray for you. Now, there's some things I know that are happening in some of your lives, and so I can pray with some knowledge, but much of what's happening in your life, I, we don't know. And the only way we know is if you share with us. And so... You can go online, and, and you can do that wherever you're at, and that includes sitting in the building right here right now. You can go online to CrestlineFBC.com. FBC stands for First Baptist Church, so FBC. CrestlineFBC.com. There is actually a place there for you to put on your prayer requests. And I don't mind if you go on there right now. Uh, by the way, you can watch me about 10 seconds later. <laughs> If, if, if you miss a point, just quick go, but go online there and you can, and then we'll see what kind of echoes we get throughout the room or what kind of feedback we get. But nevertheless, you can go on there and leave a prayer request. And I would, I'm, I'm asking you, please do that. Please let us pray for you. Let us pray for you by name. Let's pray specifically for what's happening in your life. Let us take you to the throne of grace. Because God loves you. God cares about you. Every person he cares about. So what about you? Anybody have any bad news this week? If you've uh, been watching the news it, and, and you've been missing out on bad news, please tell us what station you're watching. Uh, you can put that in the comments on Facebook. You can... Uh, text us or something on the website. Uh, let us know where you're getting only good news because um, <laughs> there's so much bad news around. Uh, uh, you can go on, on my uh, computer, I'll get notices of news. And lots of times it'll come up with CNN news and I'll have a page of about 40 things across there. Three, I think it's three columns of news that's on there. It's really hard to find something positive when you're looking there. What do you do when you get bad news? When you hear, like one of our members, that um, after multiple times of trying to get a job, that one more time they turned you down. Debbie's mom is with us, and we were talking about her grandma this week. Have you gotten the kind of bad news where your little daughter has just died? Or your son of three years old also has died another time? Peggy, my mother-in-law, was a young girl when the knock came to the door and a telegram was delivered to her. And the telegram said, <coughs> Kenneth Mount has uh, died. Uh, I don't know the details of what the telegram actually said, but it was pretty straightforward. And this was her 18-year-old brother. Died World War II in a non-military, excuse me, a non, I have the word 
Richards and lost it. Non-combat death. But she still doesn't know how. How do you handle that kind of news? Some of you in this room have been there when you received the doctor's report and the doctor said it's cancer. And just hearing that word it can drive fear into a person's soul. How do you handle bad news? How many millions have lost their jobs and continue to struggle? Honey, we don't have any money left. How do you handle bad news? What's amazing is, is that the psalmist says, I can give bad news and I will not be afraid. So that even if we receive bad news, we can know that we can trust in God and that in the end, maybe not here, we were discussing this a little bit this week, but think about Lazarus and the, and the rich man. Lazarus died with sores all over his body, a poor man with almost nothing to eat. And by the way, in case some of you are wondering, which Lazarus are you talking about? I'm talking about the Lazarus who was outside the rich man's house, a parable that Jesus talks about. And Jesus describes these two men, one's rich, got all kinds of wealth, all kinds of stuff, and, and they both die at the same time. And Lazarus ends up in heaven with the Lord in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man, who we don't have a name for, that's interesting too, isn't it? The rich man ends up in hell. And there's a great chasm in between. And as Jesus will describe that chasm, he says there's no way that you can cross over from that chasm one way or the other. Because the rich man says, please, send somebody back to my family. Send, and, and if somebody rises from the dead, that'll surely work, that'll convince them, because I don't want them to come here like I'm here. But notice, the best part of that story is that Lazarus, who has suffered all his life, is now experiencing the glory and the joy and the blessings of heaven and Christ for an eternity. And though he suffered for a time here, he's no longer suffering. You see, bad news doesn't always turn out good here, does it? Bad things, as one of the books says, happen to good people even. Psalm 112, let's uh, just read through that whole psalm. It says, praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. By the way, you're going to see a couple of key words, aren't you, as we go through here? Fear would be one of those key words. Righteousness will be another, faith will be a third. Even in darkness, light dines, dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They will have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. What the psalmist is telling us is that God blesses the righteous. Now notice, he uses the term righteous because how do we get, become righteous? None of us is perfect. We become righteous through what Jesus Christ has done for us. And, and the psalmist says, God is going to bless the righteous. Psalm 37, 29 the righteous will inherit the land and will live in it forever. Verse 39, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. For anyone who's seeking God and earnestly seeking after him, you are called righteous because of what Jesus does for you. 
Psalm 6410. The righteous will rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. All the upright in heart will glory in him. And then watch out for this one. Psalm 69, verse 28. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. Isn't it amazing that the Old Testament, the Psalms, was talking about the book of life? The Lamb's book of life? How do you get your name written in the Lamb's book of life? By Jesus. He writes it there with his own blood. In the ESV version of Psalm 112, verse 7, it says, He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. The psalmist is saying, you can get bad news and trust God and therefore not be afraid. You can actually get bad news, terrible news, and be able to not just survive, but experience the presence and the power of God. And what the psalmist is also going to show us is, is that God literally is holding our heart. God, right there, in whatever pain and fear and anxiety we might have, God is holding our heart. I need to check something with Jonathan. It appears like I just went off of my microphone. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah, something just shut off. So fortunately, uh, if you're listening online, I've got another microphone right there, so you should be able to hear me fine. <laughs> so here's the promise I can make to you. We're all going to get bad news sometime in our life. If you haven't gotten it already, you're, still, you're going to get it, Amen. right? Amen. We're all going to get bad news, and we may get multiple amounts of it. I cannot imagine what it was like for, for Debbie's grandma to lose three of her children before she died. Also before she died, one of her other sons got a brain, can't, brain tumor. Uh, they didn't tell grandma about that, but I'm sure by the time she got to heaven, she knew the details. And he died from that. But preceded and young children died while she was a, a young, young mother. We're all going to get bad news. And if we can say that God is an ever-present help in trouble, that, that God is with us and we're not alone, that no matter what happens to us, we don't need to be afraid because we can trust the Lord. So some of you know the man named Job. Uh, depending on, on your English, if you don't read the Bible much, you might call him Job. It's, it's a book in the Bible. And, <laughs> well, you know what happened to Job? To Job? <laughs> Something rather challenging, rather difficult. All in one day, listen to this, Job 1, 13 to 19. One day... When Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Not too bad, right? Just the donkeys are gone. And the oxen are dead, and the servants taking care of them are gone, except for one. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. What was this about the bearer of good news? What happens to the bearer of... Oh, never mind. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said... The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Okay, three bad messages, right? And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Okay, that's just a little bit of bad news all occurring at the same time, isn't it? 
One messenger right after another. The, the one guy hasn't even finished telling him how bad this is when the next one's coming with more bad news. So he's lost the camels, he's lost the donkeys, he's lost the sheep, and now he's lost all of his sons and daughters. All the same day. How in the world would you handle that kind of news? He's lost his, all of his assets, so he's now poor. He can't even pay bills because he has no wealth to take care of that. So he's going to become a debtor. He's lost his sons and daughters, his heritage, his future, the, his family, the people that he cares most about. And now he's supposed to face life that way. So I ask you, how would you handle that kind of news? And I have a feeling that that's a little bit worse than probably the news that most of you got this week, whatever it was. Pretty serious, isn't it? Every son and daughter dead. Servants killed. All of your wealth, all that you own, basically destroyed. How would you handle that kind of bad? Well, let's look at how Job handles it. At this, verse 20 of chapter 1, at this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He was pretty upset. Then he fell to the ground, and what did he do? And worshipped. He fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And I probably should just pause for a second to say that sometimes even God-fearing and God-loving people can raise their fist at God and say, why did you do this to me? Anger is a very common emotion when we're grieving. Emotions have to get out when we're grieving. For, for Job, what does he do? Tears his clothing. Oops. Probably still will hit it. Tears his clothing, falls down on his face, and I'm sure he's in tears even as he's doing this, and he begins to worship God. God came here naked, I'm going to leave naked. I came here with nothing, I'm going to leave and take nothing with me. And so I praise you. And so I worship you. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. Psalm 112, verses 6 through 8. What does the psalmist say? What is the person who can handle the worst news? A person, first off, who is secure, whose heart is secure. A Christian who's going through trouble knows that there's some things that no matter how bad things get, they're not going to lose. Think about it. A Christian cannot possibly lose your inheritance in heaven. It's been bought and paid for by Jesus Christ and no one can take it from you. A Christian cannot lose the presence of God in your life. No matter how bad it is, no matter how frustrated, discouraged, how afraid, how worried, how much in pain you are, God has promised to be there with you. And he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. No matter what, a Christian cannot possibly lose the love of God. He says, I love you with a, this unconditional love. God promises to never stop loving us. And finally, 
Christian cannot possibly lose their position as a child of the king of kings. Now, no matter how bad things get, shouldn't some of those things help comfort and encourage and carry you through the worst of experience, the worst of times that you might be facing? Psalm 51, verse 10, David says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. God, I want to be closer to you. I want to have that steadfast heart. I want to have a heart that's, that's undivided, that's totally committed to you. Psalm 57, verse 7, My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. And because of that, I will sing and make music. I tried to avoid a political comment. <laughs> you can sing to the Lord wherever Amen. you're at. Yes. It's not just something that God has called us to do. It's something we need to do in order to praise him. Psalm 119, verse 5, and then verse 90. That great psalm that's broken up with each di different section by a different vowel of a letter of the Hebrew language. E and every phrase in that, those sections all starts with the same Hebrew letter in there. Uh, and, and in that psalm, it's a psalm that's really speaking about the value and blessings of the word of God. Psalm 119, verse 5 says, Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. The, we want a heart that is committed to obeying what God said to us, doing what God says. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. And then verse 90, your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You established the word, the earth, and it endures. You see, that's the word that, Paul, that psalmist has been using to say our hearts are steadfast. The person with a steadfast heart, the person that's like God, who, who stays at it, who's faithful, who continues through, throughout their whole life, who, who's committed and who endures in spite of the hard times, that's the person whose heart is secure. Well, in our text, the psalmist goes on to say there's another type of a person who's able to handle the worst of news like Job did, and it's those who trust in the Lord. A, a person who trusts has their heart fixed on trusting God no matter what happens. In fact, the trust in God is the very antidote to the fear of the bad news. Could I just warn you that 98% of what we worry might happen, in other words, 98% of what we fear is going to be bad news for us never takes place. And yet how much energy do we expel and expend Waiting for that bad thing that may just happen, even today. The odds of you dying by COVID-19 are probably as great as the odds of you dying in an earthquake. But I realize people are afraid of earthquakes too. <laughs> Psalm 118, verse 6. Listen to this great declaration. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to you if the Lord is on your side? Isaiah 26, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. You want peace regardless of the bad news? Keep your mind focused on Christ. Keep your mind focused on God, not the bad news. And Isaiah goes on, and he says to us, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. We can trust God. Lying in a hospital bed, at a graveside, Amen. without work, widowed and alone. We have a friend who just this week uh, overdosed, ended up having kidney failure as well. 
and then ended up um, on a ventilator. But in speaking to him just recently, he said, but I, I guess God doesn't want me to be dead yet. God's trying to work on his life. A member of our church just got news from another friend. In fact, a friend of her daughter's, 39-year-old, committed suicide. Seven-year-old son. Why? Because the bad news becomes overwhelming. We are in a painful world. And we need to learn how together to trust God. That the Lord is with us. He's our rock. Courtney Riesick is a wife and mother from Little Rock, Arkansas. She's uh, written a, a book called Teach Me to Feel. Subtitle, Worshiping Through the Psalms in Every Season of Life. She talks about the multiple surgeries that her children have had to have. And, and each one, that, that, that just like, oh God, another one? Another problem? and issues that were happening with very young children. And she said the toughest one of all was the day that she sat down with the doctor and the doctor said, you have cancer. God gave me another chance to live this verse out, but this time I didn't walk out of the doctor's office with good news. I walked out with a cancer diagnosis and a sudden surgery. In those scary days and weeks as I waited for final pathology and recovered from surgery, God worked this psalm into my heart again. He can be trusted. Bad news may come, but he can be trusted. While I may have believed the worst, I can see now that in these persistent sufferings, God is working something deeper into me that I would not have understood if I had never been blindsided by suffering. She goes on. God can be trusted. Even when bad news comes. That is the hard part about this psalm. It forces us to reckon with the uncertainty of life. But it does so from the vantage point of trust. You know that God has your life in his hands and that he is trustworthy. That the one who knows everything that was and is and is to come, the one who knows everything that's going to happen in your life, holds you in his loving hands. Feel this. Rest in this. Take heart in this. As we prepare for communion, as we come to the conclusion of this message, there's something that we need to make our prayer. Lord, help us to trust in you now. One pastor said this, when we go to bed tonight, as we sleep, when we wake up tomorrow, Help us to trust in you. Help us to live trusting in you no matter what happens, no matter what good news or bad news comes our way in the days, months, years, moments to come. God, we pray that when that bad news comes, we pray that you would help us to trust in you then. We pray that when good news comes, you would help us to trust in you then. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, our hearts firm in you, trusting in you, walking with you, worshiping you. And we trust that you will, in a Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6 kind of way, make our path straight so we may say today, we are not afraid of bad news. The Lord is my life and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Who, of whom shall I be afraid? I don't know when it's gonna happen. 
someday Debbie or I will either wake up or get a phone call and the other one will no longer be here. And if it's me, that's going to be really, really, really bad news. If she gets the news, she's going to be better off. <laughs> But, but for anyone who's watching, she's shaking her head no. And the fact is, I just got my Father's Day card back in June from Debbie. And on it, it stated the blessing that I am to her and how much she loves me. We'll both grieve. It's not the news you want to have as a spouse, is it? And yet we all know it'll come someday. For some of you, it already has. And it, and it was, and maybe you even were at that place where you said, oh God, go ahead and take them. But you still weren't happy about it. You may have said, okay, Jesus, I'm ready to let go. But it still hurt. Bad news comes to all of us. But we trust that God is with us, that God loves us, that God's by our side, that God's not going to let go of us. And we also trust that someday, no matter how much we might feel troubled, no matter how much our hearts may grieve, we trust that because we believe in Christ, we will be with him. And the story here will end and the next chapter will begin in that better place where there is no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain, 